Yeah. Okay, cool. Let me uh, let me share my screen real quick. All right, all right. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for joining me on your your Thursday night. I appreciate it. I think it's uh, amazing you guys all tuned in, tuned in for this. Um, I'm Joel Brankowski. I live in Cape Town. I'm in the CBD of Cape Town now, freezing, freezing cold. It's very cold here today. Um, so you guys, I don't know how many of you have uh, met me before. I used to work at Woo and have been around lots of WordPress meetups. I, I think last time we were all together in person was WordCamp 2019, where I did a very, very similar talk to what I'm going to do today. But I think it's a pretty different time we're living in now. And like e-commerce is in a like much different place. So um, yeah, you guys can hear I'm not South African, um, so please don't leave me. I promise I have some credibility, um, but I'm originally from the States and I've lived here in South Africa for about 14 years. Um, people ask me all the time, why? Um, even when I lived in Europe for a few years and we came back and people are like, why did you come back? And I'm just like, look around, like, why not? This place is amazing. I love South Africa. And um, I mean, also it helps my wife studies uh, South African art. So I'm kind of stuck here. <laughs> Um, so we're not being able to hear. I'm sure you guys are all laughing, but I can't hear you. So I'll just assume my jokes are fine. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Rohan. <laughs> you're, you're doing really well. You're doing really well. Thanks, Rohan. Thank you. So, um, so yeah, like uh, just a little bit more about me. So I, I originally came here to do uh, volunteer work and then basically was like finding reasons to stay in South Africa for a few years. And I actually turned to e-commerce just to like make some money. I'd always been a very uh, hacky kind of web. I, I would dare not call myself a web developer. I think maybe not even a web designer because I only know a little bit of HTML, but I'd always like build websites with Dreamweaver and um, you know, what was it called? iWeb using Mac, like all these kind of tools like Netscape Composer going way back. And uh, in, in high school, I got into selling stuff online through eBay and States. So I'd always sort of like played in the web space. I knew WordPress, but I was looking for ways to make some money living in Stellenbosch and launched a few online stores. And then, I mean, at that time, I felt like Woo was the only platform that had like local integrations and things like that. So I just, uh, yeah, it was selling iPhone cables and Apple accessories. I called it color products. And then that led me to actually working for Woo, which at the time was called Woo Themes. And we had, they had just launched WooCommerce, which was um, actually built to try to sell more themes. And now look at it, it's like pretty much the main thing that Woo's doing, right? Themes are now the sideshow. And so, um, you know, between that, I, I worked at Woo for, for three years and then we were part of Automatic for a year. And then I was offered an opportunity to work at Shopify where um, they were just starting to do internationalization. And it was just a cool opportunity, a cool opportunity and time to like have a chance to work at Shopify. I think, you know, at Woo and like a lot of players in this space kind of look at Shopify and you see they're doing a lot of cool things. So I, I feel lucky to have worked kind of on uh, both sides. I guess this is a WordPress meetup. So I, I, I mean, I won't say who my favorite is or whatever, nothing like that. Um, I don't even think I can answer that anyways, but um, what I did want to say is like working on things related to South Africa was always a, like a side gig almost at Woo and at Shopify. Um, and I think it's just because like the market isn't super large. So it was always nice when I got to like, you know, like back in 2014, we did a deal with PayFast where we made it free. And when I was at Shopify, we put on some events in South Africa, but it had always been like a sideline thing. And so when I left Shopify, um, I had become kind of friends with one of the founders of Paystack and felt like there's nobody else in, in in Africa that's kind of pushing commerce forward more than this interesting payment company operating out of Nigeria. And I knew that they wanted to launch in South Africa. So I joined them in, um, in 2019. I've been there for the last couple of years and we launched South Africa. So it's kind of cool. I, I wanted to show that just to say like, it's been the first time in my career where I've got to spend all of my time for the last couple of years thinking about Africa and thinking about South Africa and, and um, and so, yeah, it's a, and also just a super interesting time to be part of that. And, and we are now, uh, Paystack is now part of Stripe as well. So, oops, jumping ahead. Here we go. Yeah, so the agenda for today, I, I kind of broke up um, my talk into five sections. Some are longer than others. Uh, I'm going to spend probably about maybe 30 minutes. We'll see how much I ramble on. Might go a little bit longer than that. 
um, talking about the state of e-commerce in South Africa. And I think depending who would give a talk like this, if you're a merchant or you're a developer or you've worked for platforms, the talk might look very different. Like there's so much more to talk about than, than what I'm gonna talk about. But um, I think whether you build sites, you run a store or you just shop online, I think it'll be interesting to see kind of the stats and, and, and the landscape um, and, and just kind of get, a, get, a, get some insights into what's happening here. So, yeah, before I go further, I think I really like this graphic. This is actually a couple of years old, but at Shopify during Black Friday, Cyber Monday, they have this like really cool thing where you can like, I think it's like, now it's just like lines everywhere because it's so insane. But like, they have this thing where it's like, this transaction's happening, this is the trends. And I think um, what always stood out to me was like, Africa didn't have a lot of activity. I think that would probably change by now, but I think um, if we think about broadly Africa, the continent, like we're literally like, I think on the cusp of some really big changes in terms of the way um, commerce, not just not just e-commerce, but commerce like penetrates th this continent. Um, we have 17% of the global population in Africa, youngest population in the world, one of the you know, fastest growing, yet we represent 2% of commerce in the world. And I think of digital commerce, it's even a bit less than that. So. Um, and if we think about South Africa, um, you know, and just the way like smartphones are cheaper, data is coming, data prices are coming down. In South Africa, 80% of people have bank accounts. There's 48 million credit or debit cards. Like we're we're becoming more and more poised for for e-commerce to be more inclusive for everyone and to actually. And I think with COVID, like that's the reality. Like all people are buying, even if it's maybe just airtime, whatever. People are buying stuff online it's it's changing really really fast so, so um sorry uh, just a minute uh there, i think there's someone in the waiting room you're the host now you'd have to oh them. am i the only okay <laughs> oh yeah shoot yeah. there's like seven people okay oh my god yeah <laughs> okay thanks <laughs> okay I'm, le I'm letting them all in yeah cool okay new people are in so so yeah i mean just to recap that like the opportunity in africa is huge and um and, and we're just on the cusp of something really, really big. I think if we look at the um, kind of digital landscape here, um, it's all about uh, people having the ability to, to have a digital presence as a business. And if we think about things like Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, creating that Facebook commerce tool set that's free, and the fact that so many people have smartphones that are online right now, the barriers have gone way down. If we talk just about the starting point of someone being able to communicate digitally and have an online presence. And I think from there, you know, even if we think about websites and we think about WordPress, people can now get hosting and have WordPress pre-installed or WooCommerce pre-installed. Like it's so easy, whether you're using WordPress or you're using Wix, you know, like I know Wix probably isn't super popular amongst this crowd, but like you can literally on Wix be like, I run a beauty salon. And they like pre-populate like a design and like like whip it all up for you, right? So um, it's become really easy for people to sell online. I think when it comes to, sorry, to, to have an online presence, I think when it comes to selling online, a lot of people, a lot of businesses are faced with the, the dilemma of like, do we sell on marketplaces? So obviously take a lot to really big or you have bid or buy. There are also like hundreds of other like niche smaller marketplaces and a bunch popping up. Like, do I sell through there or do I try to like get people to come directly to me? Um, and then all these technologies that are used, I think some of them cater really well for like the DIY group and some of them cater really well for like for people wanting something custom. Some of them are really focused on small businesses or micro businesses like Wix. And then you have a number of platforms like Magento or Salesforce, SAP that like exclusively just look at doing um, enterprise, right? So I think Shopify and Woo in South Africa are kind of like probably the most covering the, the, the gamut and like duking it out for for market share. So this is kind of just a lay of the land that I wanted to share to share with you guys. So um, before I go to the next slide, like how many stores do you think there are in South Africa? Does anybody want to? want to unmute themselves and guess. A million. 
a million <laughs> a million online stores <laughs> yeah wow yeah yo that's a lot <laughs> anyone, wanna, anyone else want to guess <laughs> okay now, if, now everyone will be will be disappointed yeah 8, I'm like what's that maria eight thousand 8,000. Okay. So we got 8,000. We got a million. Okay. It's in between those two numbers. Um, we're at like around 73,700, sorry, 73,700. Um, it's probably a bit higher than this because a lot of this data, I did the research like at the end of last year. So, you know, we're probably a bit higher than that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, if you just look at the growth, I mean, essentially we were doing like 40% year on year growth on ter in terms of number of stores. And then last year, it's almost, it almost doubled, right? So absolutely exploded in South Africa. Um, this is still small compared to, uh, you know, your, some bigger European countries in the States, but like this growth rate and the growth rates in Africa are, 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 are the, the, the highest in the world. So um, also if we look at the transaction value of like total transaction value of digital commerce in in South Africa it was four billion dollars last year so that's uh how much is that in rand it's a lot of rand it's like 50 what would that be <laughs> what's the exchange rate it'd be like 54 million rand more or less um so sorry 54 billion rand which okay. is a lot yeah um during COVID times this is kind of crazy like um, so I, I had this like side project I was working on last year, like Ecom Africa. I've not put much time into it this year just because I've been super busy, but um, I was tracking like how many stores were launching. So I, I used two tools, builtwith.com and this other one called storeleads.app. They're two different tools that use web scraping to pull this data. Um, and basically, if you take the first number, it's like pre-COVID, there was like 1,190 stores a month launching on average January, February. And then in March to August, which was, I think things are getting scary times, it ramped up a lot. And then I can presume September to December with somewhere in there was the second wave and stuff and just people getting ready for the holidays. It got even more intense. Um, looking at the numbers from this year, we've tapered off a little bit from that September to December um, uh, rate, but not not much lower than that. It's still like three and a half thousand um, stores per per um per month yeah so yeah so hold on, i just want to make hey, sure i'm letting people hi, in yeah hi there hey clint my name is clint how you doing good man how are you good good sorry i'm a little bit late do you mind if i interrupt with a bit of a question yeah go for it uh uh before i ask my question i got another question were you the same dude who spoke at the last word camp with regards to the state of it's yeah exactly yeah so I, it was uh almost two years ago so it would have been yeah. it'll be two years in july yeah exactly yeah yeah okay yeah yeah yeah. I, I remember i remember i was there i checked you it's a good talk um um yeah i, I noticed you don't have big commerce on uh I mean, on your slides there have you been tracking big commerce and uh is is there any significant impact have they like made any like grab at the market share or anything yeah it's interesting you mentioned them um I mean, one of the things I do at Paystack is advocate to platforms that don't have integrations in in Africa, and Big Commerce doesn't have any official integration. So, um, I'll get to it in another slide. But Big Commerce, like according to the tools I have access to, looks like they have about 80 stores in South Africa, and most of them have like a custom, like they've integrated in some custom way to accept payments. So, I think the payments integration piece is like a big blocker for them. I think they could be could be big here actually, or at least because I know Shopify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know they also have like a like a kind of like a WooCommerce extension that basically like kind of abstracts away all of the yeah. like product stuff to big commerce, but you can still yeah. like do all your like blogging and shit on on mm -hmm. on WooCommerce. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I was I took I like I took a look. I opened a test store and I took a look at it. Yeah. Um, mm. um, you know, just out of interest and everything. And um, I mean, obviously they can handle like lots of, of load. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so like for any like massive transactions or high traffic sites, like I was thinking, you know, that could be a way to go. Yeah, so for sure. They, interested, they, they, interested if you had any data on it. Yeah, yeah. I'll get to a slide that shows the, the numbers, but um, yeah, we'll have to connect afterwards. We've actually been working with them on something for South Africa. So um, I think they're like a really solid contender against Shopify because they don't charge any additional transaction fees. 
and their pricing is about the same. Like you said, they work with WordPress and they handle mm. multiple currency really well in a way that um, Shopify doesn't do super well. So I'm glad you brought what's their, that up, Clint. What's their, mark, what's their market share like at the moment in the States, like compared to some of these other players? They've kind of, um, they've, so back in the day, like when I used to work at Woo, they were, they used to have like the same number of stores as Shopify. And at some point Shopify really overtook them for small businesses. So they focused a lot more on mid, mid to large businesses. And I think they advertise that they have about 70,000 stores. And if you compare that to Shopify, who has like 1.3 million or something like there. So it's like, I think they're what, going what after big stores. Yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, like that, they might have less stores, but they might actually transact more. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, cool. Okay, shop, dude. Yeah, pleasure. Cool. So yeah, just coming back to coming back to um, kind of gr growth in COVID times. Um, if we were to compare June, June 2019 to June 2020, this is kind of how it stacks up in terms of the number of stores that were launched. So just kind of hammering home the point there that COVID had a big impact on store launches in South Africa. If we look at uh, kind of more broadly at Africa, um, South Africa is actually like has more online stores than all of Africa combined. And, uh, but if we took a look at, and we've done like a deep dive on most, like at least the top 20 African markets, they're all growing. Like most of them are growing faster than South Africa. So I think there is like a general trend of just like the barrier to entry, like smaller businesses going online and selling. So I think that's super, super interesting. Um, one stat that just like blows my mind is that in South Africa, and this is an increase from like four to five percent, but like the total amount of retail in South Africa, right? Like if you take shopping in malls versus online, only five percent of of transactions are accounted for online, whereas in the UK it's twenty one point three percent, right? So like again, just like the opportunity, I think is quite massive uh, for for trans transformation. Um, on the consumer side, in terms of COVID's impact, this is some, um, there's some really cool articles put out by Payfast. Um, I think in some great quotes from, from their, their founder, Jonathan, um, where they kind of looked at like, okay, cool. Lots of stores. We touched on that, but like, what about how it's impacted how people shop online? And I think like personally, um, I used to pretty much just shop on take a lot and maybe like one or two other shops. But I think as we were all on lockdown and you needed or wanted stuff, like I was forced to like branch out and probably shopped at like six or seven new online stores myself. And probably like a lot of you became a checker 60, 60, 60 or whatever it's called customer um, just because they did such a great job and, and, and innovated. But um, this is kind of just on demographics. Like, so Gen Z, um, I don't know what age, I think Gen Z are younger than millennials, right? If I'm not mistaken. So they're the fastest group of online shoppers, like massively increased 139%. Millennials who are the largest group grew 55%. And then I think this is super interesting, like older people, and even for myself, my family and stuff, or my, my wife's family, um, I think it's like people were like forced to shop online that maybe have never done it before. And so that group of old, older generation, the baby boomers grew second fast amongst the different age groups with 62% uh, year on year growth. I got another question there, if you don't mind. <laughs> sure, go for it. Uh, just tell me if I'm interrupting too much and I'm breaking your flow. Um, <laughs> The, yeah. the, the, the stats that you have there for like the, the percentage um, of, of retail in, in UK being, um, being what it 20, is. 21%. Oh, you, yeah. 21%. Do, do, you know, do you have stats on how much of that 21% is mobile and how much of that is desktop? Because my gut feel is that it would be largely mobile. And one of the reasons why... I, well, in my opinion, I mean, uh, it's just a gut feel, I guess, with South Africa is perhaps that, you know, the, the, the tech, the, the mobile devices that the users have aren't very high performance devices. And mm -hmm. if we just like, you know, ramped up performance and paid more attention to, you know, web vitals and stuff like that, we could, mm -hmm. you know, get more, more mobile usability. So do you have any stats on, on what percentage of, of that? Is, is mobile? No, I don't, I don't. I just, I just 
actually just like went and searched for a, a stat and read through a few articles to like fact check it a bit or like to like see if it stood against what other people reported. But I don't have any deeper details on that. I do know, um, like in South Africa, I mean, I think a big thing that gets in the way is just the amount of transactions that are still cash based, you know, so it's just cash is still the number one way people pay in South Africa. So, um, for sure. yeah. For sure. Cool, cool, cool. Cool. Yeah, this was another um, cool. Thanks, Clint. Yeah. So this was another uh, stats from 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 uh, PayFast. Um, just kind of going into like which industries did best and which suffered. I think like a lot of this is pretty common sense or like we would have known it, right? Like people weren't traveling, weren't buying tickets to events and stuff. So obvious dips there. Um, and just a ton of like food, like, I don't know, you cook I probably exploded, I'm guessing. And like all these like platforms like that and just people buying groceries online. Um, I think we all saw people trying to sell masks at exorbitant prices and stuff. So like pretty obvious that a lot of these things would, would, um, would do well, but it's astounding, like just to what extent these different industries grew. So jumping back to just like platform growth and, and, and kind of like trends and sort of stacking, stacking it up against what is happening around the world. Um, the, the, the number in blue is the number of open source, online stores and the number in green is, is SaaS. So SaaS being like Wix, Shopify, Equid, your software and your hosting packaged together as a service. Um, like open source platforms like OpenCar, PrestaShop, um, Magento are kind of like the OG players in e-commerce, right? And and they're, they're, they're more complicated. Back in the day, you would pay a fortune to have a lot of those things built. And, and now like yeah, Woo's come along and a lot of those platforms have evolved in, in one way or another, but the trend, the trend around um, the world, well, in, in the West anyways, in the US, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand is, is that SaaS is overtaking open source. And so in the US, like over 60% of online stores are, are, are on SaaS, uh, SaaS platforms like Shopify. Um, in South Africa and, and and even more so outside of South Africa in Africa, it's it's like the opposite. I mean, if we, my math's not that great, but this is like what seventy something percent would be open source, and SaaS is still lagging behind. Um, I think part of this could be tied to like even what Clint brought up, like, and, and I'll touch on that in a bit. Like, there's solutions that are popular that don't have payment integrations in South Africa or in Africa. I also think. Um, because the SaaS platforms aren't super focused on South Africa and Africa, they're not really like investing in localizing the product the way that here in the WordPress community, like Woo is super localized. Like we had a SnapScan integration, like in 20, like when it was new, right? Like, like there's a lot of plugins. There's a, there's a whole ecosystem of people to help people be successful. So I think that can't be discredited for, for, for part of this trend here. But I do think if we look at um, Wix and Equid and Shopify in particular, like they are picking up quite a bit of steam in terms of um, their popularity. So this is the, kind of the breakdown on the whole. One, one little more question, you do. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, the stats that you have, like you know, so you said like well, you know, maybe like in in America, there's more people, more stores that are SaaS stores than um then are you know like custom built or open source or whatever um like that that number you know like like i'm just trying to trying to gauge you know what's the value in that number if it's all if you've got a whole bunch of stores but they're not doing many transactions who cares you know they're kind of like obsolete you know so it almost renders the statistic like mute you know so it's like i i'd, I'd be interested to, to see like what the like in america are there actually more transactions? Like how much money is actually going through these SaaS platforms versus the open source? Um, you know, like who's actually making more money? Not because I mean, I can create a pop-up store and sell nothing and I get thrown lumped into like, oh, I'm one of those numbers in the statistic, but I'm worth nothing, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so there's a few different ways to answer that. I think it's a, it's a good point, but it's changing really quickly. So like when, when Shopify, launched and I mean up until like I would say 2015 it was always seen as a platform for like 
pretty small businesses, right? Like a DIY platform, people that are aspirational or like have a brick and mortar store and want to launch. But I think um, as that platform's developed, like it's almost default for even like mid-sized businesses in the States just because of how strong the technology is. So I think it used to be seen like you would just think SaaS, Wix, whatever, even big commerce as like something you'd grow out of. But I think that that's it's actually changing, you know, quite a bit. So I think that's that's the relevance in terms of the transactional volume. Like, I'm not sure. I, I guess like you could look at Shopify as a like financial reports to see how much volume is going through there and how big of a part Shopify Plus is part of their business to kind of get like a better idea. But I think for like the audience, it's just it's just like if you're building websites and you're thinking about how things are changing, it's just like, I think it's just an interesting thing to know, to like follow the trends, like what's what's coming, like how could things change? Why aren't they changing yet? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Sure, for sure, thanks. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool, cool. So um, this is a like a pretty detailed report I did on just migration. So on one side you have, um, you know, pe like why are pe people choosing which technology when they, start an online store, but like how much movement between is happening? Like how many people are leaving Woo to go to different platforms? So this is all based on South Africa. Um, and I'm not going to like go into a bunch of detail because it's it's pretty like, <laughs> I don't know how useful it's going to be for you all. But I think it's interesting to see how well Woo's doing, right? Like more people are moving to Woo yeah. and WordPress than are leaving it. So um, I think I'll just focus quickly on again, like Shopify and Woo, I think Shopify is expensive in South Africa. <clears throat> you pay 2% additional transaction fees in every, for every transaction. So I think probably the number or the, the top few reasons people move would be uh, price, like just how much it costs. If you're a small business and you're not making a lot of money, paying 450 Rand a month is, is a lot. Um, I think the other one is functionality. So right now, if you're running a subscriptions business in South Africa, like Woo subscriptions is amazing. Like you pay, what's the price? 149 or $199. And then it just like works on Shopify. That's, it's like you pay the monthly fee, you pay transaction fees, you pay for an app that does subscriptions. You pay them a percentage of your transaction fees. It works out to like 7% basically at the end of the day. So, um, but I do think there's a lot of people that use Woo that maybe struggle with like if their site breaks or something like that, where Shopify is kind of appealing for just like, I just need something that's like super easy to use. And, um, and Shopify's done a really good job, like with things like um, their, the point of sale system and the way that that works together. So super interesting. I think the other thing to point out here is just like Magento who powers a lot of the largest retailers in South Africa is churning merchants like crazy. So this is all like in the last year, they've churned 94 merchants. Um, mostly to Woo, but also to, to Shopify and a few other players. So, yeah. Did someone have a question? I heard like a little noise. Okay. Um, can, can I ask a quick question? That data, yeah. was that built Was that built with data? Hey, Joshua. Yeah, that's from built with. So just ran okay. like uh, migration reports on each. Yep. It's a pretty tedious process, but yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 i bet it is all right thanks. Yeah. thanks yeah sure 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 so yeah and sorry i should say like i ran this at the end of last year so it's for that's for one year of data um um like going back one year from last year so it's not like from now a year back okay yeah and then yeah this is just like a look at um monthly growth so just like what's happening on a month-to-month -month basis the, the numbers are actually, I pulled them from, from May. So I do think the Woo numbers are a little bit, um, you know, there are a number of people that like install WooCommerce on WordPress sites and have the checkout live, but aren't selling. So I think the numbers are a little bit bloated, but yeah. And, and Clint, there's this big commerce number, like pretty small for now. I think if they get a payment integration, it could, could be a game changer, for but sure, uh, for sure. yeah. But yeah, Wix has come up like in the last uh, last bit, they've come up quite a bit as well for small merchants. So yeah, these are four platforms that I'm just like, I think, like I mentioned earlier on, like uh, at Paystack, we sort of advocate because I think there is, um, again, I know this is a WordPress meetup, but like these tools are very, very, very popular. MailChimp just rolled out a stores feature that's currently only available in the US, I believe. Um, 
you know, Webflow. I think they operate in like US and UK. Big commerce is fairly global, but not not really live in Africa unless you pack it. And then Squarespace actually has a good number of South African merchants, but they're all selling um, either don't have payment methods or they're selling in US dollars. So it's like someone that's here, but like selling abroad. So um, I think all this in a way benefits WordPress and Woo, like, you yeah, know, just because exactly. there's <laughs> these players aren't here. So WordPress, hey, WordPress wins. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So just kind of diving into like which tools are like most popular uh, amongst, I, I didn't go into every e-commerce platform and I think it's probably worth just focusing on Woo, but uh, MailChimp is incredibly popular for marketing, talk for chat, and then you mentioned WooCommerce subscriptions, Xnilo locally for hosting, it's done a great job. Um, Jetpack's really popular for analytics. There's some other cool tools there as well. And then for logistics, two really great platforms, Scrubbill and UAfrica enable merchants to like print labels and verify addresses and stuff. Really, really useful. And PayFast is leading the way for payments um, historically. So I think Woo really, really, like I mentioned before, just benefits from like super easy for people to build plugins and extensions to make it better. And in South Africa, we've done a really good job of that. Um, this is the Woo marketing break breakdown, which is crazy. Like just look at MailChimp. Um, yeah. It's insane. Yeah. I think it's, it's, I mean, I use MailChimp. It's free. It's a great tool. The integration is really good to Woo. I think it's free as well, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, and then themes wise, like, to be honest, I've kind of lost touch with the theming space. Um, it seems like, well, it's pretty clear that some of these frameworks are just really popular. And I know from a few agencies that I'm friends with, like they choose, I think a lot of agencies like choose one framework now and then use like child themes or different, like all the thousands of designs that fall under that. But yeah, it just seems like it's wild to me. 11% of people using Woo or in South Africa are using Divi. Fortunately, I think there's so many different, like, like I said, designs that it's not like they're all going to look exactly the same, but still very, very wild. Um, I'll share these slides with everyone afterwards too. So just kind of going into trends, um, this is the last section. And then I'm sure we'll have lots of time to chat. If anyone wants, has more questions, we can chat. But I think uh, marketplaces in general are, like if, if there's a successful marketplace in a country, it, it makes, it has such a massive knock-on effect for e-commerce in, in, that, in that country. Um, so I think it also poses like a massive risk if you're a retailer though. So it's like your best and worst enemy in a way. Like take a lot, <clears throat> in the time I lived in South Africa, I'm sure you, everyone here has experienced it, is like come such a long way. Like it's pretty amazing. Like I sometimes will buy stuff knowing I can get it cheaper somewhere else, just like just because it's just so trustworthy, right? They've really dialed in the user experience and customer service and pickup points and all this stuff. Kind of have a good idea when your stuff's gonna arrive most of the time. Um, so, so their power is really in their scale and like their approach to doing business. Um, so I think like for e-commerce, and this is a little bit just qualitative, like my own experience, but like, if you shop on online stores outside of these marketplaces that have it not dialed in, like the couriers in South Africa are like, well, national couriers, like not good. <laughs> That's a problem. And just the, depending how retailers ship to you, it's like such a different experience. Like sometimes like you have to sign for stuff or they say they're going to come between like a 10 hour period. Um, the way people notify you, whether or not merchants have free shipping, like it feels a little bit like there's not a really strong, standard for like how good things should be uh like this is ge i'm generalizing quite a lot but i think like there is like a lot of work that needs to be done i don't know if that will come in the form of like one courier startup like killing it or you see a lot of these pop-ups of um last mile like point-to-point -point delivery services if you think about like ordering on uber eats or something like that like that's the kind of experience i think we want and like will help build more trust with e-commerce. I think the way that it is now, like some merchants really get that right and other ones are trying to figure it out. Um, fortunately, like I mentioned, like at the very least, what we what has happened in the last, I don't know, five, six years is there's some of these shipping aggregators popping up that just make it easier for you to, 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 
to, sh to like use a bunch of different couriers. So I've heard from a lot of merchants, like if you're shipping something from like Cape Town to Joburg, like there's certain couriers that are the best. If you're shipping something to Limpopo, you might use a different courier. And so it's like a kind of fragmented landscape for logistics. And at the very least, like you Africa and Scrubville are enabling merchants to be able to like affordably ship things, easily ship things and, and, and have some form of communication to, to their customers. So I think that's great. Um, and I, but yeah, I think there's a lot of room for like improvement in this space. Cause like, and maybe even it means like some other marketplaces popping up to make this happen. Cause like, that's the other thing. Like if you're selling online and you have your own online store, like you can also sell on marketplaces, but yeah, it feels like it's sort of take a lot of bust at this point with marketplaces, <clears throat> the payment space. Obviously, I, uh, I mentioned I work at Paystack. Um, so I've, I've spent a lot of time like learning about the space and like digging into it. Um, I think it's pretty crowded, like you can see, but it's also like in the in that first slide where I showed you all the e-commerce platforms and how some focus on small and big. It's kind of like that in South Africa too. Like PayU really just works with very, very large merchants as does Paygate. Yoko is really focused on like retail, like small retailers. But the thing I wanted to say about it is like, like Yoko innovating and doing what they're doing, Paystack entering South Africa, Stripe acquiring us. I think these are all really good things for, for South Africa, just like the competition pushing like payment companies and experiences to be, to, to be better, to like help people get started quicker, you know, even the rates wise, you know, like the more competition there is usually fees, fees come down. So I think it, it should lead to like a much better experience for checkout for, um, and for merchants to, to um, you know, just have a better experience and, and also for developers to be able to just like, you know, build what they wanna build, integrate into the tools they wanna integrate into and just hold payment companies to like a really, really high standard. I think um, this pay later space is super interesting too. So I, I don't know how long, Pay just now and PayFlex have been around for maybe maybe they've been around a long time. To me, it seems like they're relatively new or becoming a lot more popular. And um, I was chatting with one of the guys from PayFlex to see if he would share some stats with me. And he said they now have over a hundred thousand people that have paid with PayFlex and a thousand merchants. Um, also heard from from some merchants that we've spoke to, spoken to as Paystack, like as much as like forty percent of people's transactions are coming from some of these pay later platforms. So I think the really cool thing about this is that um, for people that maybe don't trust a store like buying online or they're afraid of the quality or they just, obvi the obvious one is they don't have the money, but like the trust part I think is really cool. And pay just now and pay flex aren't using a model where it's like um, a credit card where the interest compounds and you can get trapped in debt. Like it's literally just make installment payments and there are penalties if you, if you miss it, but they're fixed and they're capped. So I think this is a good thing for consumers pay just now and pay flex in particular, um, just for getting people to trust buying online more. Um, and for merchants, it enables them to maybe get sales that they wouldn't have got otherwise. So the downside of it is just, it's super expensive for merchants. Like the prices are between five and 7% to take payments through those platforms. So they make their money that way. Like they don't make as much money from consumers. They make their money from, from, the, from the merchants. Cool. And then um, I always initially don't like the word omni-channel because it sounds super cheesy, but it's an important concept and it's, in, and it's becoming like more and more relevant, like earlier when I talked about the 5% stat, 5% of retail coming from coming from uh, digital, whereas it's like 20% plus in the UK. Uh, this is this is tied, this is all kind of tied to that. So it's the idea that you can you can create like a unified experience for um, for your customers in store online and anywhere else they would have a touch point with you. So I think like more and more South African retailers are trying to figure out how to like connect their online sales with their store for obvious things like, like think about logistics, like not even having to like ship stuff, like people coming and picking it up in the store and like leveraging stock on site or things like if I know I can buy something at Sportsman's Warehouse and if it doesn't fit 
I can just like return it like at the store. I mean, right now that's not really um, possible at a lot of retailers. Like it's, there's a lot of room for improvement. So for retailers, it gives them the opportunity to, to actually just learn more about their customers and extract more lifetime value out of them. So it's like, for them, like the information is the power. So they're, you know, they're aiming for more click and collect. And um, yeah, so I think like Yoko's done some cool stuff for small businesses here. Shopify point of sale has this new thing where you can like put, like you can tag your, your inventory at different locations. So you can literally have like 50 stores you can have your stuff in a warehouse and you can tag all of it through locations. So I think like Shopify point of sale is not huge in South Africa, but I think it has a lot of potential for creating that, that omni-channel experience and, and giving merchants really great insights into what's happening with their, with their transactions. Um, and then yeah, like direct to consumer, this is, oh yeah, this is almost my last point here. Um, so some, so more and more brands are that would have normally just sold through other retailers or um, through like other channels are are, are starting to, to sell direct to consumers to cut out the middleman. So a lot of the brands you love, um, yeah, you can like get stuff directly from them now. And that this space is, is absolutely exploding, uh, especially like fashion, beauty products. So the reasons behind this is really like, profit margin. <laughs> so like brands can cut out, like I said, cut out the middleman, they can reduce their distribution costs and, and just have more control of the profit margin. The other one is just being able to create like a custom experience um, and have a relationship directly with customers so they can control the entire experience from like the, their supply chain website, um, through messaging and all that. And then, and then really it's the data, you know, like being able to give a good experience to customers means having all the access to data in real time. So they can find out what consumers want and trends like much faster. So this is, this is really interesting to see, to see this unfold. Um, these are a few like sites I thought of that I knew launched relatively recently that I, that I posted. And then, then the last trend is just social commerce. So we, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but I think, you know, officially like viable pins are a thing on Instagram in South Africa. I think that launched sometime last year. Facebook commerce is super interesting, right? You can have a Woo store, Shopify store and sync your products to Facebook commerce and they're automatically available on Instagram and WhatsApp. The actual buying experience isn't available here yet, but it's likely coming at some point. And so in South Africa, you know, we have, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of like informal businesses or small businesses, like lots of people use Instagram now to discover new products. And you have so many people that are selling on there that will like, you know, you find it there, you go to WhatsApp and it'll be like pay cash on delivery or EFT me. It's like a very informal experience. And I think there's a lot of room for innovation here. Um, Paystack, we have a few tools that touch on this that are pretty popular that are free. <clears throat> One is called, uh, well, it's pr there's product links and storefronts that work together. Basically, you can just spin up like a free little mini store, manage your inventory and, and you know, sell things online. So a lot of people are using that, you know, so basically like someone finds you on Instagram, conversation happens there or on WhatsApp, and then you send them the, the link to your little storefront and they check out there. So I think, like tools that are again, making like e-commerce more inclusive for people that maybe just don't want to have pay to build a website or don't know how to build a web, like build something super custom, don't have to like spend any money on it, but can, can try it out. I think it's like a very, very interesting, interesting space where the, 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 the cost to entry is zero. Right. I think that's, that's something that is very, um, needed in, in, in South Africa and, and more beyond. So I think like e-commerce platforms across the board are gonna prioritize, they already are. I think yesterday Shopify announced that like they're powering the checkout experiences on uh, some of Facebook's tooling, you know, and it ha you don't even have to have a Shopify store. So it's like, wow, okay, so how does, <laughs> how does that work? Like they're, you know, it's like, you don't even need a store. Like they're just, they're, they're powering a payment experience basically. 
So there's a lot of convergence around like where payments fit in to e-commerce. So like I mentioned earlier, MailChimp is a marketing platform. They've launched payment experiences. Um, there's just like, it's kind of all like boiling into like marketing, social payments. I think partly because where the payments are, like there's, there's obviously money to be made. So um, it's really interesting though. Like I get really excited about this kind of stuff because I just think a lot of people want to sell online and be part of this, but like, just feel like it's a massive burden or it's a big cost and it just doesn't have to be. So like this, this, this space gets me really, really excited. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I'm going to, uh, yeah. So Paystack has sponsored this meetup. So I'm going to send everyone in the follow-up email, like a, um, a promo code for you guys to save money on, payments. Um, like I don't want to, this isn't a sales pitch, so it's just available. If you, if you want to give it a spin, there's no cost or whatever. Um, and yeah, like very happy to answer any questions about e-commerce or anything I talked about. Feel free to use okay. the chat or you can, you can unmute and um, ask away. Mm -hmm. Clincher again. <laughs> hey, hey, um, um, so is there any talk like a pay stack? Cause I, you know, it's like you mentioned MailChimp's like launching some e-commerce stuff which i find is like super interesting they kind of lock themselves in with that name but anyways um so like there is this like kind of little bit of a hurdle with regards to shipping you know like you said you know there's not so many like reliable sh shipping uh, like couriers and it's different in different regions and what like whatnot and my thinking is that like it's so close to the payment space like is there no talk at paystack of like you know if you guys bundle that in like bundle shipping like into the payment services and you i mean you have the, the reach and the clout to go around and like create a whole bunch of deals with a whole bunch of different couriers and then just take that problem away you know and it's like okay well so now it's like oh you, you get payments and you get shipping like bundled into the package is that, is that something that's spoken about or could i could i add two things to clint's question sure um, yeah hey, hey joel <laughs> thank thanks thanks for the talk um it's great um yeah about shipping as well i mean does anyone has anyone heard anything more about um there was an article in the in the in the, in the news a little while ago, um, which could potentially be of quite big impact to to e-commerce. Which was that the South African Post Office was uh, going to the High Court to contest something that they have exclusive right to deliver small parcels. I don't, I can't remember how they de defined small parcels. I think it was under a kilogram or two. Um, yeah, but that could potentially have some effect on on um, couriers or forced couriers to have to artificially <laughs> increase the weight and size of parcels just so that they can <laughs> legally deliver them. And number two was um, um, uh, also in terms of something that, 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 that doesn't kind of exist in South Africa, but use, uh, Gumtree used to have like an escrow service where it would make it safe to purchase um, like the escrow service would keep your money in 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 trust and then uh, once it was couriered to you you could release a type of thing it, it, mm. it just made the transaction safer and then i can't remember what that was called it was like shepherd or something mm. it was called shepherd, shepherd something like that and then it just yeah. overnight it just disappeared and yeah. i thought it was such a great service and it was such a pity that it disappeared so i don't know do you have any thoughts on, on either of those yeah, yeah. Sorry to so, piggyback on your question. No, Just, no, that's fine. No, I appreciate I appreciate it. I mean, it's all kind of under logistics. So yeah. the first question was Paystack related and how we're thinking about shipping. I mean, so all of our commerce tools that we have, there's also like payment pages and invoices where you can just like, you can create a page to get paid or you can send an invoice for it to get paid. Um, I think... I think particularly for like storefronts and product links, like there's definitely a opportunity for us to play there where like someone's ordered a product and we have an integration into like shipping, shipping labels and stuff, but, but kind of more broadly for payments. I don't, I don't know. It's not something I think that seems like a space. I, I don't know, like at least it's not something that I think has come up, but I think definitely like um, that storefronts tool. I mean, we, we're not trying to 
it's not like a replacement for a for a Shopify or a Woo. It's really just like a way for people to get started and kind of get to a certain point where they might upgrow it at some point. So we just really want to like lower that barrier for people to get started. So so yeah, definitely shipping would would is something that doesn't exist yet on that product that would help. Like right now you can just add like shipping rules, like if it's in Joburg or Cape Town or whatever, you can add different prices, but <clears throat> definitely it would be cool to to partner with someone to 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 be able to print labels and stuff. Um on the the second questions, um I think it was from Nicholas, yeah. So to be honest, I haven't seen that thing about South, South African Post. I don't know if anyone else in the group has. Um, and then what was the other part of your question around escrow services? Um, I do remember seeing that at Gumtree and it has come up in my time at Paystack in talking to, you know, we talked to a lot of startups and different people that have all kinds of needs. And I think it's really interesting, you know, even think about running a marketplace, for example, um, as the person that runs the marketplace, you don't want to pay out your sellers till they've delivered the goods, but you're not necessarily in control of delivering those goods. So there's definitely like something there, but I don't know anyone that's playing in that space in South Africa. Um, it's an even bigger issue in other markets that Paystack operates in, like in Nigeria, like people really struggle to get people to pay online. It's almost all like cash on delivery, like for, for physical e-commerce products. So escrow would make a lot of sense, but yeah, it's, um, it's not, I don't have much more to say about it than that. Does anyone else have any comment on the South Africa Post thing? Like, I don't, I don't know much about it. I, um, I read about it and I, I read the article and I dismissed it in the same way that I dismiss like the fact that TV licenses are going to be bundled into Netflix. It's something that like, <laughs> it's something that the state wants, but is probably unconstitutional mm -hmm. and it's just never going to happen it's like yeah. there's no ways that they can they can do that shit if if it goes that route it'll be yeah i mean i, I don't see how legally that they could do that like, yeah i, I, I seriously yeah, the, doubt the, that it's gonna happen the, the story really was that any parcel under one kilogram has to be delivered by the post office um yeah. and they were they were they were mentioning some arcane law that was that was put in place like in 1985 or something so I, uh, like yeah, i really it's a like a, a, would, a, bit, a would, bit ridiculous totally i like i would completely have like no concerns about that because like when that happens then that's like that's <clears> a part of the like the apocalypse you know you're gonna have bigger concerns <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, there, was, there was a, a there was then a suggestion from from someone to say well if, if you order say something that only weighs 100 grams then uh then these uh, online merchants should just add some weight to the parcel so that it's just over uh, yeah. one kilogram <laughs> yeah yeah you get, you get free fishing weight <laughs> and i think like i'm sure south african post is just looking at what other countries like in, in the us and uk for the low for like low cost shipping like it's it's almost the fault that you would go with like US Postal Service. Um, and I'm sure they're just looking at the space and being like, no one trusts us, we're losing out. How do we, how do we like, how do we win this back? But uh, yeah, I don't, I really hope that doesn't happen. I hope they don't try to enforce something like that. That would be crazy. Mm. Any, any other questions or comments? Uh, I think there was a question from Melanie, I think. I'm just looking mm. for it. Uh, it. It was just around the time when you were talking about marketing and uh, MailChimp, you said it's like it's the biggest. And she was saying, would you advise us, would you advise to use MailChimp just because it's popular here or would it be better to look at other CRM systems? So she said, for instance, I saw that Omnisend was popular in the US. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know the competitive landscape there really, really well, to be honest. Um, okay. I think, yeah, I think I would do my homework if you're looking at solutions and decide. I think there's quite a few free options, like freemium options. Um, mm -hmm. I think for like very, very high powered marketing automation, I know like Klaviyo has done really well, um, or at least like seems to be doing really well. But yeah, I've, I've heard good things about Omnisend and there's a bunch of other platforms as well. Also, um, MailPoet, I think, is really good for purely for, like, mail marketing stuff. So, 
Um, so that's a good one as well. Yeah, so much free stuff out there. Lots of options. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's very good. Anyone else with another question before we thank everyone in look up? Yeah, I, I, I have one. This is Josh. Hey, Joel. This um, I work at uh, Peach Payments. Oh, and, gosh. Um, yeah. And we've actually uh, we've never met, but we've, we've traded emails over over the last yeah. couple of years. Um, I'm really interested to know what you think about any of these platforms creating their own payment processing. I mean, we see Shop Pay, we see um, a lot of these tools, whether it's Mailchimp or Wix or any of these tools, creating their own payment processing mm. and, and really doing that in house. Yeah. And and taking, I mean, we we'd all expect that to happen in the United States or Europe first, but then in three years to five years, potentially come to these shores. Mm. What do you think the likelihood of that actually happening is? I think it's inevitable, but it's like, if we look at um, any of the platforms you mentioned, like Wix or Shopify or Woo even, I think it's like, they choose a partner to roll that out, roll, roll that out with, and then kind of like, focus on one market at a time. And I think it's probably because of the dynamics of like each market's payments, like pricing and, you know, figuring out how they price it and what kind of deal they're going to get out of it. But I think those platforms are doing it purely, well, one, I think they can create more value for their customers, right? Like Shopify prices, like their, their monthly subscription fee and the price for payments when their Shopify payments is kind of hand in hand. So it's like, it just makes sense to pay more monthly, but you get a better rate, right? So I think they're trying to create value for their merchants, but it's also a commercial thing, right? Where they are trying to get as close as possible to a payment provider and create a great experience, but also like they can make money in that, right? So it's not so simple to just like scale that into all these different countries. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. I think it will, I think it will happen in South Africa inevitably but it's, it seems to be that these e-commerce platforms for the most part tackle like north america and then they try to tackle europe and then and then maybe a few asian markets and then australia you know like we're very far down the list so um Joel, is it, is it yeah. not also that um uh, i know in south africa in particular that the, the the banking laws especially surrounding credit cards are so draconian that um i i, I think it's this too big a barrier to entry for most companies. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I would imagine hundreds of millions of rands go into starting like a, a bank. And I think, I think to process credit cards, you virtually have to have the legal framework of almost a bank behind you because yeah. there's so much legality that goes, goes around it. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that is, is maybe a part of it, but, um, but I mean, all of these, even though it's called Wix payments or whatever, right? There's there's a there's a payment company underneath that that's yeah. in collaboration with them, you know, making that work. So as like long as there's payment, yeah, as long as there's yeah. payment companies like Beach or Payfast or Paystack or whoever, like that are in markets, like they can partner, they can partner, but um, but there's also just it's it's not that straightforward. Like there's a there's a proper like integration and figuring out the commercials and all kinds of stuff. So it's not, it's not such an easy thing to, to, to roll out. Um, but I don't think there's anything in the, like you're right about the banking in South Africa in terms of it not being easy to work with banks and stuff like that. And it's a, it's a very strict reg regulatory framework, but I don't think that will get in the way of, you know, these types of things coming to South Africa. It's just about the market size for these companies. And, and I think South Africa is like, interesting and definitely probably the first market in Africa that these companies, these platforms will do it. If you even based, I mean, look at the numbers we shared, like <laughs> we're in a better place with e-commerce in South Africa than, than other markets, but it's still pretty far down the list. So yeah, is that, is that you your know, question, Joshua? It, yeah. it, it does. It, it's funny you say South Africa. I always think of Nigeria as that market entry country. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's because, well, I think it's because for whatever reason, it's easier for a foreign company to navigate Nigeria than mm -hmm. it is South Africa and the central bank. I don't know enough about why that is, but it, it, it just seems to be what's happening. And I, yeah. think, I think the entrepreneurs there have done a much better job of reaching out to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And 
and bridging the geographical divide than South African entrepreneurs have. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't, I don't know why that is. And this is, this is me watching it from Cape town, just like you. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I just, yeah. it just seems like that there is a Silicon Valley, Nigeria connection, connection. that South Africa yeah. does not have yet. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I think, in, I think you're totally right, Josh, in terms of like interest from tech and investors in Africa, like, Nigeria is super interesting. Just um, and I mean the size of digital payments, I think, from stuff I've read anyways, is Nigeria is bigger than South Africa. But for e-commerce specifically, like in e-commerce platforms, I think there's a lot more traction here than Nigeria. Um, so so yeah, it's interesting though. But you're totally right. Like, I think if, even the number of like funded startups or how many companies are getting into YC and stuff, like Nigeria is Nigeria is hot. <laughs> I mean, the population, you know, right, is massive. Yeah. Um, as for, you know, a lot of these payment gateways focus on credit cards, but there are a ton of people in Africa who don't have credit cards and want to pay with digital e-wallets and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, even PayFast doesn't really pander to that market much. I mean, are, are you guys at Paystack thinking of integrating with MTN and Vodacom and their various digital e-wallets? Mm. So in, in West Africa, we do. I mean, I, I think like our kind of the way we think about entering new markets or supporting existing markets is to enable people to pay the way they, they want to pay or like what's most popular. And so like in Ghana, for example, 85% of transactions are on MT, are on mobile money, mostly MTN mobile money. And in Kenya, I think we've all heard about M-Pesa, right? Like being like massive, like without M-Pesa, like you can't really do payments. Yeah. Um, in South Africa, it's, I mean, it's interesting. And definitely since we work with the, the telecoms, it's something that we'll look at, but, but mobile money hasn't really taken super well in South Africa. Excuse me. And I'm not, I'm, I don't know all the reasons behind it, behind it or the history, but, um, but I mean, we're, we're close to the telecoms. And so I think it's, there's definitely an opportunity there. There's also some other interesting um, payment methods. I'm blanking on the name, but um, there's a company that works with Pepcor. I think it's called, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name. I'm so sorry, but That's so fine. Pep, yeah. So Pepcor, you know, Pep, Pep stores, you know, biggest retailer in Africa, they, they, they have this company that powers all of the, um, all of these point of sale terminals in the in the townships mm. and informal settlements and um, massive network right of of um, uh, point of sales where people can you know get digital vouchers and things like that for with cash. So I mean it's it's wild and they they're they're working on some stuff where you know I think they want yeah. to yeah they want to basically make it so people could you know get vouchers or things like that for people yes. that don't have bank accounts don't have cards you know, to be this, able to buy stuff online more easily, so. Yeah, I see um, Sage. Sage is going into that space as well, mm -hmm. where you can basically sell something online and then a person can go and pay at their local shop for it. Yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah, um, no, that's cool. Let me yeah. see if I can find the name real quick. Like, it'll be in my email. I just got it. Okay, it's called Flash. That's the name of the Flash, company. okay. Flash, yeah. So, that, I, mean, we're, I mean, we're definitely I'll interested. Just, Oh yeah, sorry. the The product name is one for you. One for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think flashes flashes the company, but if you're on in the store, you're buying a one for you. One for you. Yeah. yeah. I think it's super interesting. Like, I think online is pretty new for them, but I think it's like it's an interesting play. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, basically at Paystack, I think it's it's early days for us in South Africa. Like, I mean, most people want to pay with card, EFT, or QR payments, but it's definitely it will be interesting to see, you know, as we, yeah, as it, we get it, further, like how things evolve and, and what we can do to like, yeah. On your market, you know, I mean, the lower yeah. LSM groups are definitely not paying by a credit card. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm, I'm involved with a lot of, you know, selling educational products in this time of COVID. And there are a lot of poorer people who really want to buy, but can't because they don't have credit cards. And yeah, I th we're struggling to find a good solution that uh, integrates with all these various digital wallets. I mean, mm -hmm. we're with PayFast at the moment, but yeah. Yeah. 
No, that's um, really cool. Maybe, maybe, hmm. maybe to maybe to add on to what Joshua, to what Joel is say, has been saying, um, to answer your question there. Uh, if you look at South Africa, the landscape is a little bit different because as we have seen from the slides of Joel, South Africa is a banked nation compared to some of the countries, especially the Western countries where the majority are not banked. And uh, as Joel was saying, about 84% of South Africa uh, you have bank accounts compared to other nations, especially West African countries where people rely on mobile money. So it makes a little bit of a, of a difference and uh, South Africa is a different landscape altogether, which might not be interesting to payment processing companies uh, or there is a smaller market rather for payment processing companies. Uh, uh, compared to other countries. And if you look at mobile money in South Africa, uh, Vodacom had it before, and we all know it failed. Uh, so, and also you can make payments, peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments in ShopRite, in PEP, in all those stores. So it's a different landscape altogether compared to other countries, may maybe. Mm, no, you're right. Um, just to, no. Yeah, I was just, no, you go, go. No, it's fine, you can go. I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, sorry. But, but just, just, to, just to add on, just to, just to add on, on uh, what uh, the previous speaker just mentioned, uh, I remember reading some stats uh, on um, the number of purchases that are made on Take A Lot. And uh, if you look at the, 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 the is, I think it was, uh, they, they were actually comparing, they were looking at the salaries, right? And they were saying most of the, the people that buy on take a lot, um, people who earn more than 20, between, I think it was 20 to, to it was above 20,000, right? And I mean, looking at that target market, I'm not sure if you get uh, the cash buyers. And from speaking from experience as well, one of the things that we actually tried on one of my e-commerce sites was uh, we tried to do the cash payment, right? And many a times we did actually, we are looking at the data. Most of those products were rejects. Like, I mean, they could so not rejects, but uh, they were not being paid for. Like mm -hmm. we get the, the driver and the driver gets there and you know the, the cash payment doesn't happen and we end up taking it back again mm -hmm. into the store. So that look, was one we, of the challenges. Yeah, yes. look, we're doing digital products and we're finding a lot of abandoned carts. I mean, what Prince said is true. There are a lot of people with bank accounts, but they might have like Capitec bank accounts, but they don't have a credit card. So yes, you can go that whole instant EFT thing, but people don't want to capture their bank details and put their passwords in and all that kind of thing. Anyway, no, I'm I not looking... My, sorry, Capitec card on, on any website, uh, and it's a debit card, not a credit card. Yeah, well, I, I don't have one, but... You know, I'm not expecting you guys to solve our solutions. I just wanted to know uh, our problems. I just wanted to yeah. know if uh, Paystack was going towards that e-wallet space or not. Mm -hmm. okay. I think uh, in general, debit cards are widely uh, um, uh, accepted and used. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not really credit cards. Uh, Capitec is a perfect example. Um, okay. Even, even some of the purchases you can make, I can't remember if you can even make some purchases from within um, uh, the Capitec app. I can't remember how what it yeah. looks like, but but uh, and they do make it so simple. I think part of the challenge, uh, Joel, I think maybe you can weigh in on this one, is what does how does consumer literacy, uh, it, you know, is there anything that needs to happen on that front? Um, and also just assessing uh, what's, what are the consumer sentiments and how have they been shifting over the last few years compared to when you started? I think maybe let's say your first, I don't know if it was three years ago when you did kind of your first dive in. Consumer sentiments towards like payments or e-commerce, blessing? Uh, both. Um, mm. you know, like, so, so I'm just thinking like a, comp you know, complete transaction, you, you, you're online, you 
buy, you pay and just that, that whole experience, like what's, what's that, what's, I don't know if you've seen, noticed any shifts there over the, over, let's mm. say, I think, was it, is it 2019 you lost? I think uh, that's the last, I mean, before. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a good question. I don't know if I have a great answer to it. Like a lot of my time was spent like prepping for Paystack in South Africa and we've been kind of live for like seven months. So I feel like I'm so deep in all of that, but I don't know if I can see a lot of like trends or changes to be honest, blessing. I wish I could give a better answer. Um, I mean, I think broadly speaking, I mean, like, like I, in the presentation I said, I think, I think people, obviously we've all just been pushed to, to think about contactless and digital payments in a different way. There's a lot of interesting like innovation around um, like tech in like restaurants and things like that, or like education and medical, like just like online stuff that's super interesting. Like people thinking about things in completely new ways, but that's more like merchant behavior. I don't have a great answer for the consumer part just yet. Um, but yeah, good question though. You've stumped me. <laughs> um, can I change topics a little bit? Uh, yeah. Joel, what, like, so how much concern do you like, do like payment gateway providers have with regards to like crypto being the future? You know, I mean, like, does, does that like, like kind of render you guys obsolete and how do you like stay relevant in, you know, it, like in a climate where you're not needed? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's like, I mean, obviously things are volatile at the moment. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think that it, it would be naive to think that in 20 years time, where like digital currency is not like, like widely used. And so like, do you guys like care about that at the moment? Or you know, is it on your radar? Or like, are you just like, fuck it, let's, you know, Let's see what Let's happens in 20 years time yeah it's an interesting one i'd love to hear josh's perspective too if he, if he wants to weigh in because he works in, he's actually been in payments longer than me but i think from my perspective like since almost the beginning of my time at woo and at shopify like everyone's always kind of said the same thing like like yeah we even added some crypto platform like crypto payments um and it just doesn't take very well i'm not sure if it's just that like like crypto is is big and gotten a lot of attention recently, but I still don't think it's like super pervasive in terms of like an everyday type of um, thing. And it's also like, I, I mean, recently probably saw like it was sort of like these crypto exchanges are like banned from Nigeria. Like it's still like regulation wise, there's a lot of like tension around how it works. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, there are a lot of, if you're a payment company, like there's, I guess, some level of risk or like how much do we need to adapt to this space? Um, you know, are cards going to be the future forever? Or like even with bank payments, like what if bank bank to bank payments completely change and there's, there's you know, maybe not money to be made there. Um, mobile money, you know, already is a, is a challenge in Africa to a certain extent, like figuring out how to work with those telecoms and things like that. So I don't know. It's not something, I mean, even though it's gotten a lot of attention recently, I don't think it's something that we're, super concerned about like definitely spend some time thinking about if we want to embrace it or not but it's not um not really something that is of massive concern i don't know josh if you have any additional thoughts yeah, so we talk, yeah. that's fine we talk about it too just like any yeah. payments company um yeah. i think the things that i've heard on the technical challenges are a lot on the risk side where the clearing of the the clearing of of the full account process takes way longer than you'd think. Um, I am, you know, I, I'm the head of marketing. I'm not the technical, <laughs> I, I don't know the technical ins and outs, but I know that when we've talked about it internally, I get these sort of shaking of the head being like, you know, you don't yeah. understand what it'll do to the risk side of the business and how long we'll have to wait before settling certain transactions. Mm -hmm. And they just shake their head. <laughs> yeah. and, and I know not to ask more questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think everyone wants the opportunity to use Bitcoin way more easily than any other coin. So it, it's something we talk about all the time and we want to find a better way 
and the right way for South Africa to to sort of have access to that. But it's it's it, it is a big challenge. Yeah. Uh, maybe to to add on also to Joshua what uh, to what Joshua is saying here. Yeah. Anyway, I'm Prince uh, from I work at Yoko from Yoko, so we are also part of the payments. Uh, so maybe Little payments hang out. <laughs> yeah, I think what what uh, the question that Clint is asking is critical. But I think uh, for payment companies, what you have to understand first is adoption. How much adoption do we have for cryptocurrency, particularly in Africa? And uh, that entails how you build your, your, your products and your whole ecosystem to process that. So when you look at crypto, you will realize that in as much as it is popular, but its adoption in Africa is very low, very slim. And uh, also we're talking of regulation. Uh, currently, so in South Africa, crypto is not yet uh, officially uh, allowed by the government. So from a payment processor's perspective, we are a highly regulated industry, as you would know. There are lots of things, lots of paperwork that you need. So for you to process something that is not um, uh, regulated as much, it will be very much of a risky. I think we saw PayFast try to do that, but uh, they've pulled out. So you realize that there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And also just by the fact of uh, the volatility, you know, crypto is a high volatile currency. So it goes on to the exchange rates uh, that somebody is purchasing it at. There's just a lot of work and that needs to be, to be looked at. So I think if there is more adoption going forward, obviously payment processing companies will build to cater for that market. But currently, I think it's a matter of adoption because mm -hmm. regulation is not much important because the government can be pushed it and uh, we can go to court for that. But anyway, uh, it's just all about adoption. Uh, that yeah, for sure. I mean, that. I mean, I definitely agree with you with adoption, but I mean, you touched on it with regulation. I was going to say like, regulation? This is Africa. This is the Wild West. We don't give a <laughs> shit about regulation. Like. <laughs> Like, no, the, the payments processing, I think my colleagues will agree with you. It's a highly regulated industry. You don't just do what you want. It's a highly regulated uh, industry. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna get some you're gonna get some player that comes along who's just gonna say screw the regulations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, South Africa, a lot of these countries want to control, want to know where money is going to, how it's getting there. I think that's the scary thing. Like, but I mean, even it's processing like, payment. It, yeah, sorry, Glenn. I mean, when it comes to when it comes to processing crypto payments, to track that regulation, I mean, to regulate it just because you know you, you can fly under the radar quite easily. You know, it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's like. It's like tantamount to trying to enforce like a law outlawing masturbation. It's just like, you know, it's like, you, you, how are you going to, like, you're never going to be able to like catch everyone, you know? It's, it's like, I, I, I don't know. It, it, like the way, the way that I kind of see it is that you're, that if this, if, it, if there is adoption, then it, there's going to be like very little ways for people to like enforce regulation you know i mean maybe uh, at some point if you if you're going to convert that crypto into you know dollars or rands or whatever then you know then it'll be flagged but you know if we get to the point where um you know where where crypto is is just like used everywhere for everything then i don't see like yeah i mean it's 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 tough it's tough but i like I and mean, it's so like anonymous and under the radar that you know it's like how are you going to regulate that stuff you know it's a very difficult space i mean like that's why i just thought you know it's, it's like i mean my my understanding of it is is very small but you know from from what i've seen is is that it, you know it is it is pretty unregulatoryable if that's a word yeah yeah conversation stopper Thank <laughs> <laughs>
No, I think I, I'm it's I'm really enjoying the comments and stuff. I just don't have much more to add to it. Like it's uh I think even processing yeah. payments for crypto, yeah. like for wallets, is a massive challenge. Uh, like I mentioned, Nigeria getting shut down. Even in South Africa, like the Luno and all those, like they process EFT payments for their wallet. You know, it's not like like that's heavily regulated for even just for them. That's what they do. So to jump to like it becoming part of commerce transactions seems like it's still a ways out. But I mean, what are they doing like on the dark web and shit like that? How do those transactions work? You know, it's like, I mean, it's, you, there's there's an account and, you know, here's my fucking yeah. wallet. You, you put the money in my wallet and that, there it's done, you know? So it's like, mm-hmm. if, that, yeah. if that type of transactions becomes... Yeah, then... but there's no chargeback right there either to protect yeah, you yeah, right i yeah. mean that's the difference it's gaps it's like cash on delivery in essence there's no yeah. intermediary that you're sort of putting faith in for, for that sure. type of transaction right so that there you go for, for sure yeah yeah because you can't like build in there's no like built-in mechanism for the transaction to be released only once the goods are delivered right. kind of thing yeah right yeah. Well, there's no recourse, right? You paid the money. No re- you never yeah, got yeah. the goods. Now, what are you yeah. going to do? In, in the Bitcoin yeah. world, you're done. <laughs> I mean, there's yeah, yeah. there's literally no one to go to. So yeah, for sure. But I mean, like a lot, a lot of that, a lot of that is like kind of, um, you know, almost like reputation based. You know, the recourse is the reputation of of the company. You know, so it's like, um, you know, like I'm sure that if if you go onto the dark web, there's like, you know, this, no, go to that dude. He's a reliable drug dealer or whatever, you know, it's like, you know, it's like that dude doesn't screw you. And it, it like that, like that is the recourse it, that like your, the, the recourse is the, is your reputation. Um, and, you know, like potentially, you know, that could work, you know, they just becomes like these retail stores that, you know, are reliable retail stores and they accept, direct bitcoin transactions into wallets and i mean uh, it's all hypothetical obviously but I may interrupt you it is very easy to put on bitcoin payments onto a website very simple to do straightforward the fact of the matter is how many customers actually use bitcoin to buy a product because in the first place it costs you about 100 rand for every uh, transaction at the moment so people don't use Bitcoin to buy day-to-day small things. That's about it. You say it's a hundred rand per transaction. Yeah, actually, close on. Uh, there's actually a solution to that as well. I don't. I don't. Uh, I mean, just to, I think it was Prince who mentioned the, the adoption issue. Uh, there are yeah, countries yeah, like sure. I mean, if you look at the data, I think it's Nigeria, right? They have adopted current. I mean, cryptocurrencies very well. Yeah? Uh, South Africa, not much, but I mean, there are countries that are adopting Bitcoin very fast. And when it comes to the regulation part of it, it's, it's not like the government or, or the, the minister or sorry, the, the, the governor doesn't know that uh, cryptocurrencies exist. They are actually using the, the, the blockchain, blockchain technology. So they are aware, but uh, I don't think it's really an issue of regulation or adoption. I, I think it's on the customer side. And uh, just to answer the, the, the other issue, like when it comes to the small payments, there are other cryptocurrencies that you can actually use for small payments. I think it's, um, I think Coinbase, Coinbase, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is now accepting, uh, they've got a sort of a plugin that you can use. And they're using, I think it's one of the coins called LTS, if I'm not mistaken. So you can actually use that for small currencies as well, for, for small amounts. Who was who who the speaker who mentioned the hundred rand per transaction? Where, like, where does where does that hundred rand come in? Because from my have understanding, you, you, sorry, this mm-hmm. is me getting the person. Gideon. If you do a transaction via take Bitcoin and you do a transaction, there is a mining fee, and the mining fee comes around about anywhere between eighty and one hundred and twenty. It's probably about. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know there was a money fee. I thought well, that's... find out your details I... and things before you come with theories and ideas. It's going to take a long time for Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies to actually take the market. Dude, Just dude, I'm asking, I'm asking questions. I'm asking questions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> we're, not yeah. very, 
yeah we, do, we are not very educated about this uh, bitcoin thing like <laughs> cryptocurrency we are all new we all want to know if you have information we just asking. my my understanding was that the that the miners get rewarded with bitcoin that was my understanding i'm asking questions here gideon Could you no just absolutely no 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 not a problem i'm just merely saying that bitcoin is still going to take or cryptocurrencies is still going to take probably the next 10 years or so to mature to some form of daily usage so it's it's a lovely idea lovely concepts to play with but it's if we're looking for the practical solutions at the moment it's no point uh saying okay we must go the bitcoin way it's more a concept of you know it's, i i actually agree with uh, with the other lady mel in terms of we need to look into the mobile wallet i mean in africa that is our biggest biggest problem is getting people to pay so bitcoin and crypto lovely ideas but it's it's still too far-fetched for actual practicality for now. So please don't take me wrong. I didn't mean to be nasty or negative. <laughs> if you got that, right. thank you. Yeah. Sure. sure. Thank Speaking you. about yeah. getting people to, to, to pay, can, can I ask a, it's somewhat of, a, of, a, of going on a tangent. I'm, I'm, I'm busy helping a nonprofit um, uh, animal sanctuary with their kind of marketing plan and their site. Has anyone got any tips for me besides Indiegogo or Kickstarter, what's the latest latest local is lekker kind of thing for raising money for nonprofits? I don't have a lot of experience in it myself. And unfortunately, neither do the do the do the people starting the animal sanctuary. They, um, they just have experience with animals. Sorry, get in again. Try given gain. G-I-V-E-N-G-A-I-N. So I think it's, I yeah, think yeah. they're local, it might be international, but it's yeah. Okay, thank you. That looks there, like a good link. Uh, and there are a couple others too. There's a Thunder Fund um, and Backo Buddy. I've heard of Backo Buddy, yeah. Yeah, um, Thunder Fund. So, yeah, What's Thunder Fund the, and Backo uh, Buddy are, are run by the same company. Um, and they just have a little bit of different, but they, and they're op they operate out of South Africa. Yeah. Um, thank quick. You. Quicket started playing in that space a bit too. Um, the, the, they're more of a ticketing platform, but they've they've got some cool fundraiser capabilities and stuff as well. Sorry, sorry, who started? Uh, Quicket, 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 with a with a Q. Uh, I dropped. Oh, sorry, I DM that instead of yeah, uh, Quicket. Okay, sorry, one yeah. second in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, online events. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, awesome. Thanks. There's a good, um, there's a good, it, I mean, it, th those solutions that Josh mentioned and, and some of the others are sort of platforms to make it super easy. If you, if you, if they've got a website and a WordPress website, they can use WP Give, which is pretty cool. I think the, the thing with some of these fundraising platforms is they do tack on a little bit extra fees often. So, you know, obviously you want to get them as much money as they can without paying fees. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Great. All right, cool. I, any any last questions before we before we wrap up? I think this is I enjoyed this conversation. It's been fun. I see that there's also like shopping gives. I don't know who shopping they are, gives. but it's like you can basically like add um you know, like add donations when you do a checkout. So it's like, you know, like you're buying a product and you know, it's like you go to KFC and would you like to give one rand for kids and shopping gives is like a um an add-on that you can oh, yeah. I know I know shop Shopify has some integration into it as far as I can tell. Oh cool. Okay, thanks, thanks, Clint. Yeah. I'll look into that as well. Because I mean, you can partner, you know, with like other retail stores and say, like, you know, um, you know, those retail stores when they take transactions, then they can donate to you guys through that, you know, mm. rather than just awesome. direct trans direct donations. Yeah, you know, it's like an add-on mm. basically. Okay, yeah, I'll put that forward. Thanks. Joel, do you have a um um? Do you have a? Uh, you were talking about how. South Africa is a very undeveloped e-commerce environment. It's kind of an untapped market almost. Uh, 
I don't know. Do you, I just want to get a sense of like with 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 all your experience in in, in payments and sites, and do you have a quite a bullish outlook of e-commerce in South Africa, or quite a bearish outlook? And I think that can probably be summed up with answering the question like, if if you're going to start a shop these days, is it enough to only have an online shop? Can you sustain yourself, or do you still have to have a brick and mortar? In your opinion. Hmm. The second question, I think definitely yes, but like every four out of five failed. So I think it's being marketed as much easier than than it is. And um, and it's just more competitive, right? Like oh, any fashion trend or thing where there's a startup in South Africa that's created a new whatever swimwear or something, right? Like there's like 20 other ones. It's, it's really, really competitive. So. But I think you can do it without a uh, brick and mortar, um, definitely. It's just, yeah, you just got to create something very unique and very um, find your audience and just deliver a great experience. Um, but I think there was like a time where people were saying like, oh, brick and mortar is going to die. I think we all know that's not true. I think like the brands that do the best create both like a great experience in store and, and, and stuff like that as well. So. Um, in terms of my outlook on e-commerce in South Africa, I mean, I, I, I can't help but feel like very, very optimistic. I think um, if I, I mean, I guess like if I just think about when I first arrived here and uh, what's happened in the time I've been here and just like the way that it's growing, I, I feel I feel quite optimistic about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to like quantify or to say like to what extent it's going to explode. I just think what what makes me feel good about it is just like like even if you think of like any business like you've gone to the store like everyone has a website now like it's just like things are all moving in that direction and there's just a lot of interesting local players doing things um like even this pay later stuff or logistics like people are sort of circling the space now after covid where i just feel like like if we especially if we talk about that five percent in the uk being 20 percent, like i definitely feel like it's going to move more and more towards digital. So, um, so yeah, I feel I feel optimistic about it. I feel even more optimistic about the growth happening outside of South Africa. Not that it's greater, just that there's even there's just like a lot more um, room there, right? Like there's just it's like like e-commerce is such in its infancy in a lot of the other markets. So, um, one thing I think though that that just haven't seen happen even in the startup space or e-commerce space, like it's very strange to me how little cross-border movement there is. Like, I can't think of many brands that have like been in South Africa and launched in Kenya or something like that, right? Like, it almost feels like people here think like, oh, I'm gonna sell to Europe or like sell to the States or drop ship or something like that. I think that's a bit of a shame almost. Like, I, I mean, maybe I'm too idealistic, but I think yeah, it, is. it would be great to think of like a world where people actually like we have amazing stuff here like i guarantee that a ton of our brands here would kill it in nigeria right for example or maybe vice versa but like people don't think like that and nobody's really making it very easy for people to operate that way so yeah, i think except on, easy except amazon ec2 obviously <laughs> yeah but, yeah but yeah like, they're an exception. yeah yeah so so yeah i mean it's 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 fun though i think like there's a lot of challenges like even just thinking about payments i think there's a lot of challenges but it's it's a very exciting like space to be in so yeah i hope you guys enjoyed the talk and the conversation it was I, yeah thanks so much for having me we definitely did thank you so much thank you thanks, thanks, so thanks, yeah. thanks joel that was great definitely. thanks guys yep. Thank cool. you everyone else for attending. So this was this was good. And uh, we are always calling for speakers. If you are another Joel, <laughs> if you want to give something, <laughs> if you want to talk about something that's going to benefit the community, uh, we are we always one. We are always, always grateful for people who would want to share with the community. So you can always reach out to me uh, or Rohan, our other meetup co-host. So... Thank you. And I would also like to thank uh, Ex Nilo there, the guys who are sponsoring our Zoom account. So if you have something to share with the community, or you can be a sponsor, or you can just, if you have anything to give to the community while you're a speaker, we're also welcome for that. So I'm just putting it out there. 
that please do not shy away. If you want to say something, if you have something to contribute, you can always reach out to us. Yes, Ex Nilo is my only web boss company. It's a good company. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks, 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 thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Cheers. 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 Cheers.